Do you absolutely love Bouguereau's paintings, but want to be able to capture that subtlety in a way that is loose and painterly, or in a way that's doable to paint in one sitting? This video is for you. I'm going to be breaking down the exact steps to paint this portrait in a way that captures the subtle nuances of flesh tones that Bouguereau is famous for. That being said, this approach can be applied to any artist who creates the kind of skin tones that you want to see in your portraiture. So whether you are a big Bouguereau fan or you simply want to take your portraiture to the next level, let's go ahead and dive in. The very first step that I needed to take in order to make this painting a success with really subtle skin tones and that beautiful translucent quality that I'm looking for is that I needed to pick a reference that already had those qualities. So for me, in my case, I picked a reference that reminded me of a Bouguereau painting. Now, the main things that I looked at here were to do with the lighting, but complexion and the pose of the model did help. Dress would have been the last consideration here, especially for a portrait like this one that's really just the head. So I didn't take just any old iPhone photo of a person and expect to be able to translate that into really sophisticated approaches to color and modeling the skin. If you're going to put in the hours to create a really beautiful, masterful painting, it is worth it to take the additional time to find a reference that sets you up for that success. Then the second step that I needed to take was to actually find a Bouguereau painting that would teach me a lot of the same lessons that I would need to learn in order to successfully create this painting. Another way to say that is that I need to find a Bouguereau painting that looks really similar to the reference I have and thus the painting I want to create. So a Bouguereau painting that has similar lighting, similar composition, similar pose of the model, etc. I probably spent just as much time in creating this painting pinning down an ideal reference and finding Bouguereau paintings that could serve as inspiration or as a guide that I could use, as I did for the painting itself, just to give you an idea of just how worthwhile it is to take this step. As I did my research for this, I looked at probably hundreds of Bouguereau paintings, and there were a lot that really stood out to me as far as being really beautiful and inspiring to my own work. But I had to actually whittle these down, and that meant finding the Bouguereau painting that really best matched the kind of reference I had at my disposal. So there were some Bouguereau paintings that I found that I just set aside to look at later for additional inspiration, but for the purposes of this painting, I really just landed on two different paintings to look at that had an overall similar lighting, similar complexion, um, similar color to the skin that I knew would really help to guide me. Similarly, these pieces also featured the same pose of the model. I would tell you the names of these pieces, but I do not speak French and I don't want to butcher the names of these paintings, so I'll go ahead and show you the couple of Bougro paintings that inspired this piece here. So notice here the similarity between the two images that I landed on from Bouguereau to use as inspiration compared to my reference. Notice how they have very similar lighting, they have a very similar pose. I essentially got these as close as I could possibly get them without having reverse engineered the image completely. Now compare this to another image that I just loved from Bouguereau that I just saved for future use and didn't actually reference in this painting. Notice how the pose, the angle, the lighting, this is completely different. It really benefits you to be intentional with how close you can get your inspiration and your reference. If you can look at a Bouguereau painting and see how he solved certain problems, then it becomes so much easier to solve those same problems in your own painting. But when the problems that Bouguereau was solving are completely different from the problems you're going to have to solve when you sit down to create your original work, you are going to feel like you're at a loss, and this is what we want to avoid. So put in that extra bit of effort and really make sure that your reference image and your inspiration are as closely related as you can get them, especially when you are looking to build your skills. 
The more practiced you are and the less you're probably relying on YouTube tutorials to help you through this, the more you will be able to wing it without necessarily having such a close reference to guide you. But for now, this really is going to help you to see a tremendous leap forward in your own practice. From here, an optional third step would be to complete a master copy. This would be based off of one of the inspiration images that you found from Bouguereau, and it would allow you to practice mixing and matching the exact color and value choices that Bouguereau makes without having to worry about that extra step of interpreting a raw image. Master copies are one of my favorite exercises. I think they are incredibly underutilized and to really understand the reason why, I think it's helpful to look at music as an example. If someone is learning to play piano, for instance, we do not expect them to sit down at the keyboard and begin just composing original songs. In fact, we basically never expect anyone to do that. But for whatever reason, when it comes to painting, that's exactly what we expect. The benefit of learning Bach preludes or a Beethoven sonata is that they teach us so much about how to control our fingers at the keyboard and actually create the kinds of sounds that we are interested in. Then down the line, if we actually do want to compose original pieces for the piano, well, we have a much broader repertoire in terms of our ability to execute on these ideas. The exact same is true when we talk about painting. Master copies help us to stand on the shoulders of the artists who came before us to best understand the accuracy of the drawing, the color mixing techniques, the actual paint application techniques that we need to use in order to go from raw canvas all the way to finished product. What completing a master copy really teaches us is that if we create a successful copy, it shows us that we have all of the physical capability to put the paint down on the canvas in a way that we are aspiring to. If we're actually producing master copies that align with our goal for our own paintings, well, the only thing that we didn't do for that painting was the decision-making process of what to paint. Everything else from the color mixing to actually laying the paint down on the canvas, you had to physically do. Master copies are such a great way to isolate each one of these variables to help you work on them one at a time until you truly have the skills necessary to work the way that you want to work. As a result, I had planned to do this for this painting, but the color study I completed in a previous video, which I will link above, gave me a good amount of practice at this already. I also find that the more consistent I am in my practice, so the more I use the same techniques and work off of similar reference and complete the same kinds of master copies, the less I need to rely on them as a warm-up tool for any given painting. So although I didn't complete a master copy for this painting in particular, I actually wound up being very successful here, and I really owe that to the dozens of master copies I've done before now. Now, the next step on the journey is to complete any preliminary work necessary to be able to fully envision the final version of your original painting. So for me, that involved first cropping down my reference image to the exact aspect ratio of my canvas or panel to make sure that my subject fit in that panel in a way that was gonna be visually pleasing to me. This can also help me to get in an accurate drawing early in the painting process, so it serves a couple benefits. Once the cropping is complete, I might blur out any details that I don't want to include in my final painting. I will also plan any abstract brush marks that I would really like to see in the final. And I might even create some thumbnail size color studies to just help me warm up. Basically, anything that I need to feel completely prepared, this is the time to do it. This is why having a really good reference matters and is absolutely worth the time. In my case, I worked off of a reference shot by Howard Lyon. He has dozens of incredible reference packs that are available really affordably. So if you are tired of working off of crummy iPhone photos as references, but you're not quite ready to hire a model or stage a photo shoot of your own, go ahead and check out these reference packs from Howard so that you always have them handy. I have a link down in the description to check them out. 
Now, once your plan is complete and you can all but visualize exactly what that final painting is going to look like, it's time to begin the painting process itself. And to do this, it is essential to have a plan for the painting that is tried and true. This is where instruction or having a mentor is incredibly helpful to make sure you are using the method of building up the painting that works for the kind of style that you want to achieve. I had to take the slow route to DIY this process for myself of really finding the process that works best for me. But if you know that you want customized help in reaching your unique goals for oil painting and you don't want to go the slow way, I would love to help. There's a link down in the description below to find out more and apply to see if we're a fit to work together. Going back to the method that I actually use to begin this painting, in my case, I do have a method that works for me and for whatever reason, I just did not do it here, <laughs> which is why her skin looks absolutely blue in the beginning of the block-in for this painting. So I wanna talk a little bit about what my mistake was here so that you can learn from it. The method that I usually count on and should have used here is to begin by establishing the key landmarks of the face and determining exactly where they need to go on the canvas in order to match the composition that I mocked up in Photoshop. Now, this part I actually stuck to pretty well, but the next step is where things took a turn. So once the drawing is simple but accurate, I would begin blocking in color from dark to light. The reason that I find this works so well, especially when your canvas is a light color because you don't have any kind of tone on it or the tone that you do have on it is pretty light, is that the canvas color is able to be a placeholder for everything that is lighter than the value that you are currently working in. So if you start with your darkest darks, the color that you mix for that dark dark essentially is going to go in as is and the white of the canvas represents everything that's lighter than that darkest dark. And then you move down to the next lightest dark from there. And this should read pretty intuitively to your eye as you progress through. What makes my block in here so alien looking is that I actually started with a pretty accurate color for the skin tone, but I had down none of the context that would help it to make sense visually to our eyes or our minds as we look at this block in. As soon as I realized my mistake, I tried to go back in and establish everything that was darker and cooler than the base flesh tone. This accomplishes two things. First, it allows the image to make sense at a glance because the dark areas of the face are being represented by a dark area of the canvas versus the dark areas of the face remaining white like the raw canvas um, or relatively light like the initial drawing that I did with just some translucent transparent oxide red. It also allows the colors to make sense in context so that the skin tone doesn't look so incredibly dark and so incredibly blue. As soon as I actually started to go back in and reestablish everything that is darker than that big average swath of skin tone, the painting starts to come together a bit more, but it did make my job much harder than it needed to be. And if I had simply followed the method that is tried and true for me, I really could have avoided this. And you could also look at my block in to the painting and think that it doesn't look nearly as wild <laughs> as it probably does. So from here, I spend a good amount of time course correcting for that mistake in my process. And my primary objective was to get it to a point where the shapes of color were once again, simple, but accurate, just like I wanted for my drawing. This means that the overall shapes are accurate and they're put in the right spot, even if they don't have much detail. And the colors of those shapes are a good average of the color that's being described in that area. From here, all I need to do to progress forward is to whittle down the shapes until they are smaller and smaller, and the color within each of those smaller shapes is more and more specific. This is how we will continue to build that nuance into the painting as it comes to a finish. As a reminder, at the beginning of this painting process, I talked about making sure that you use a plan that is tried and true based on your comfort zone as well as your goals. So the method that I show here of drawing with paint or laying down an average mass of color that you then work further into isn't a universal goal or a universal ideal. It simply matches my ideal way of working right now. 
Other painters may intentionally leave the canvas entirely blank and then tile down each small area of color piece by piece, or they may start with a highly detailed pencil drawing that they paint over, or just about anything in between, and those approaches are every bit as valid. But knowing the ideal method for you that helps you to paint the way that you want to paint is huge, which is why having a mentor can have such a big impact. If you're interested in getting to work with me as a mentor so that you can actually reach your big painting goals, I have links down in the description to find out more about working together with me and to apply to see if we're a fit to work together. Make sure to check out part two of this video where I take the painting from this stage all the way to the final result, going more in detail to get those lifelike flesh tones coming up next week. And if you have any questions about this process or how to get really accurate, nuanced, beautiful flesh tones, but in a way that is a la prima or wet into wet, let me know in the comments so that I can answer your questions in that upcoming video. Until then, happy painting.